Poke the Box is a manifesto about producing something that's scarce and thus valuable. It demands that you stop waiting for a roadmap and start drawing one instead. You know how to do this, you've done it before, but along the way, someone talked you out of it. Listen as Seth Godin explains what Poking the Box is all about and why it's important for all of us. This podcast is the first in our classic series from the Water Cooler Hangout. Enjoy. Hi, I'm here today with Seth Godin, who is a good friend and a frequent visitor to the Water Cooler. He has written 12 or 13 or 14, I've lost track, best-selling books. He writes the world's number one blog on marketing, and he is an initiator who loves to poke the box, and we'll explain that in a little bit. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, Poking the Box, which is Seth's latest book and the first book to come out of something he calls the Domino Project. So welcome to the water cooler again, Seth. Well, thrilled to be here. Thanks for taking the time, Bob. Well, thank you. So... I've always wanted to say this about the water cooler. Why don't we just dive right in? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So poke the box. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that the only thing that's worth creating is something that's scarce. Uh, diamonds are worth more than bottled water because they're scarce. What's scarce in our environment right now, what's scarce in our world, in our economy, is not access to capital. I mean, the guys at Color just raised $41 million yesterday, nor are we have a scarcity of buildings or people who are willing to do what they're told or factories in China that will make whatever you describe for them. The only thing that there's a shortage of are human beings, real people, who are willing to stand up and say, I'm going to go do this, follow me. And this idea of initiative, of viewing your work as a platform for making an impact is uh, a crisis that there isn't enough of it, that there aren't enough people who ask what's next and then go do something about it. Why do you think that is? I mean, uh, is, is it just because we've been taught to uh, be compliant or is, is there some other reason? Well, you know, if you go to a kindergarten class, you don't see any kids who have trouble raising their hand. You don't see any kids who have trouble singing a song or telling a joke or uh, volunteering to do something. Somewhere between kindergarten and college, we burn it out of you. And the reason we burn it out of you, it was, uh, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's just true that for 80 years, our culture, our economy was built around the idea of compliant factory workers who did what they were told. Uh, whether you were working, uh, loading in boxes for a show at the Beacon Theater or selling insurance for an insurance company or assembling uh, SUVs in Detroit, the factory works best if you do what you're told. And so if we are in a factory-based economy where productivity comes from people doing what they're told, well, of course we want to train the world to do that. And that works great during the industrial age. But this is the revolution of our time, Bob, and what's happening right here, right now, is the industrial age is dying, ending, over, and the new age is taking its place, and that age is filled with change and where compliance is hardly valued at all. So if I wanted to find an initiator, what would I look for? What, what does one look like? Well, often they find you, right? But uh, – I think that what we see in every field, whether it's uh, a musician or a salesperson, is someone who gets great joy out of redefining the status quo. Uh, you know, so that there's a, a long tradition, for example, of, uh, of baguette bakers, boulangeries in Paris, where by law, every baguette was precisely the same. The ingredients were described. And when my friend Lionel Poulain, uh, started his second or third generation bakery, he refused to even make baguette because to do so would mean to comply. And so as a human being with the same skills as all the other human beings he was competing with, he made a choice. And his choice wasn't how do I make more money, though he ended up making millions of dollars. His choice was how do I make a commotion? You know, that story reminds me of, uh, have you been to Germany? Uh, just briefly, yes. Well, they, they have, you know, they have a lot of laws and regulations for everything, but one of them has to do with how to pour a draft beer. 
And you can only pour it at a certain speed out of the tap, and it has to. I, I don't know the rules myself, but I, I first time I sat there and I marveled at how long it took them to pour this. And it didn't matter how many people were waiting and wanted to have a drink, they were not going to change because this was the rule and this was how they had been taught to do things. And I was thinking, you know, what if someone actually just started pouring, you know, and, and started <laughs> just just started laying those things up there? What would happen in Germany? I mean, would it fall apart or what, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, to be clear, I don't think we need a commotion everywhere all the time. Uh, I don't want the people at the pacemaker assembly line to be innovating new ways to assemble pacemakers. And if I was a fan of draft beer, I don't think I'd want uh, traditional draft beer to be poured any way but the regular way. Uh, that said, where the growth is coming in our world, where the real forward motion happens, is not from people who do it exactly the way it's always been done, that the brands that we talk about, the Amazons and the JetBlues and the Nikes and the uh, Apples, they're all built on individuals who are figuring out what's next as opposed to waiting for instructions. So you and I both know a lot of creative people, and yet I see a lot of creative people who don't do anything except think and come up with ideas, and they're very creative so uh, what's the difference between, you know, someone who's a creative person and, and a, an initiator? Well, I'm not ready to say that that kind of person you just described is actually creative. I believe that it doesn't count as poking, doesn't count as starting unless you finish. And finishing means interacting with the market. Finishing means putting your idea in front of someone else at least one other person, to see if it makes a change happen. That that person who's busy uh, sitting in their ivory tower writing stuff down is basically hiding. Uh, that a key part of the creative process is failing. And if you never interact with the market, you're not capable of failing. I'm guessing both of us have been uh, box pokers and initiators our whole lives. I, I, I know. Well, actually, I think I used the nuns called me an instigator instead of an initiator. But uh, what's what's the downside of poking? What if what if someone pokes back and you and you you know you lose your job or you're abused or whatever? I've seen that happen. Well, is that a downside or is that part of the deal? Um, you know, I think that if the people who initiated were always met with a standing ovation and every initiation succeeded, most of us would lose interest in initiating. That the reason that walking the tightrope is interesting is because the tightrope is not on the ground. Uh, the reason it's interesting to make art of any sort is that you're not guaranteed to succeed. Uh, so I don't view it as a downside. I view it as part of the deal. You, you, every coin has two sides. Anyone who says to you, uh, failure is not an option has just announced that success is not an option either. Right. I think in the book you said something that uh, about poking that it requires some tact too. That what what did you mean by that? Well, you know, if we look at the case of Ignaz Semmelweis, a uh, brilliant doctor in the 17 or 1800s, he figured out that uh, tens of thousands of women were dying every year because doctors were not washing their hands after they delivered a baby. Now, even if I didn't know the germ theory, I'd wash my hands because that's disgusting. But leaving that aside, uh, <laughs> if, if you don't wash your hands and then you go deliver the next baby or go work on another patient, you spread disease, and that disease was killing people. And he figured out through rigorous testing that uh, washing hands saved lives. So mm -hmm. 20 years later in Europe, the question is, how many doctors wash their hands? And the answer is none other than him. And the reason is that he was a jerk and that rather than selling his idea, rather than interacting with the market in a way that helped his idea spread, he just screamed at people. He taunted people. He denigrated people. Any doctor who didn't immediately do what he said, he wrote him off. And so 20 years later, women were still dying because he didn't understand that part of what it means to ship is to get people to embrace your idea and do something with it. So we still have to sell. Yeah, I mean, and we don't like that, you know, that we wish that people would just realize our brilliance and do what we say. But in fact, that's not what happens. Right. So tell me this. Can everyone poke the box? Well, you see, there's 
two schools of thought. One school of thought says uh, the gatekeepers and the people in power and, and those who have been approved have all the talent. And how dare anybody propose that the public could edit an encyclopedia or write a blog or record a song or put something into the world. They should wait for approval and authority. And then there's the other school of thought. And I'm a member of this school of thought that says uh, human beings are magical and that if you believe in them and open the door for them and give them a platform, uh, sometimes they will disappoint you, but often they will create something worth noting. And I find that the more I believe that, the more often I'm disappointed and the more often I'm thrilled to discover that I'm totally right. And the book itself is the first book from the Domino Project, which is, well, why don't you explain it? Well, you know, I decided last year I should stop being a hypocrite. Uh, I had been publicly and privately ar arguing with people in the book publishing world, a world I love and have been in for 25 years, that they were on the wrong track, that they were fighting to maintain a status quo that was dying, that uh, this mindset of scarcity was counter to everything that was happening in every other form of media, which has a mindset of abundance. And books were harder to find, more expensive to buy, more difficult to share than any other form of media. And I wanted to do something about that. And soon after I announced that I was done uh, with traditional publishing, I heard from my friends at Amazon, who I'd been pushing for 15 years to think about this sort of thing. And they agreed to power a publishing imprint if I would, would start one. So that's what we've done. And what we're trying to do is not take over book publishing. We're trying to uh, fail and fail often and shed a light on what we do that works and doesn't work so that people can copy us and run with the ideas. Uh, I've got seven interns working with me, uh, really cool people. We are launching about a book a month. Our next book will be announced on Monday with a lot of fanfare because we've done something pretty cool with it. Um, and the goal of the first bunch of books is to publish manifestos, which are uh, 15,000 words, 80, 100 page long hardcover books or Kindle books or audio books or collectible books that come in multi packs or single packs that are designed to be inexpensive and urgent to share. And it's working. My first book, uh, Poke the Box, has outsold in its first three weeks um, all the other books I've ever done by a lot. Well, my personal opinion is it's the best book you've ever written. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm serious. It's very relevant. Uh, it's relevant to me, and it's and and I just everyone that I've talked to uh, that have I, and I've sent out some books. I bought a five pack and sent some out. And I, in fact, I've got to tell you, one of the the, the people, and I, I I can't really announce it here right now, but one of them actually um, had a, said, "I've had enough of the corporate world. I've been wanting to do this, and I'm just going to go do it." So they're they're. They, and they have a plan, and they're off doing it. So I, I'm a, I'm really happy about that because it's someone close to me. So it's it's a tremendous book. Um, and one of the things this person asked me was, how do they start? If you want to start, you know, how do they do it? And I think you've given them some hows here, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about just, you know, people are excited right now. How do I go start poking the box? Well, the first thing to understand is the book is a permission slip, not a how-to. Some okay. people have been waiting for someone to say go, so I said go. Now, if I was going to give people a how-to, the, the simplest how-to I can give you is this. You must start small. That what goes with poking is not just taking initiative, but taking responsibility. You cannot say to your boss or your friends, I'll go do this, and if I fail, you'll cover for me, and if I succeed, I get the credit. So that means that the answer is small. Small mistakes, small errors. That if you ask anybody who knows how to sell, they learned how to sell by getting rejected over and over again at small sales calls. If you ask musicians how they learn how to play jazz, they don't learn how to play jazz in front of 10,000 people. They learn how to play jazz in front of six. And so the, the magic here is that you set out to have lots and lots of small failures. I guess my rule is simple. The person who fails the most wins. And I would argue I have failed more than most people. And in order to fail the most, you have to have failures small enough that you get to keep playing the game. So the key is to just start it and then to finish it. Uh, the key is to start, finish, and learn, and repeat. Yes.